Okay, so we'll give, it's about seven now. We'll give people about five minutes to log in. Uh, I expect like, you know, 10, 15 people maybe, something like that. And um, the plan is what I'm going to do is show you, um, you know, how to get the um, spreadsheet, uh, planning spreadsheet off the website. And then, um, you know, how to use it and how we use it on trips. And I've got a few people in the audience here. Uh, Jeff's been on our trips, Sandro. Uh, I think that's it. And um, so we've got some people that have used it before or a version of it. Um, the beauty of this spreadsheet is you could use it for any trip. It could be canoeing, with your camping, whatever. You just, you know, change the sheets and the information on it to use it for whatever activity you want to use it for. Um, a canoe trip is pretty complicated because you end up, you know, the planning, um, you're going to drive to the put in, which could be way up north, you know, an airplane away or train away. And you got to have everything kind of coordinated so, it, you know, the trip goes off well. So getting there, running the trip, and then coming back home, of course. All right. Can people see my screen? There should be something that says WCA on it. Yes. Okay. Excellent. You got the website. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this event is, I'll just click on the event here on the calendar, December the 7th, and wait for my computer to spin. It's a trip planning um, template, spreadsheet template <coughs> for um, organizers. Um, anybody can be an organizer. Uh, it's also handy for if you're on a trip and you want to help the organizer. Um, so this is the trip here and the event you signed up for in the Zoom meeting. So what you could do if you're on your home computer, you want to follow along. So normally when you log in, um, you go to the home page and you log in. I'm already logged in automatically because the computer remembers me. And normally you would have a login command over here, if you can see my cursor, and you would basically be logged in and you can see all the menu now. Uh, when you're not logged in, some of these things are, are hidden because you're not a member. Um, specifically the you know resources, the organizer, uh, the forums, the bulletin board, stuff like that. So, what you can do, um, if you want to find that spreadsheet, you go to Organizer Resources. So you click on that. And again, we wait for the computer a bit. And what there is is a um, page that lists a bunch of documents that we have. So there's guidelines and how to post an event. Um, so if you click on these links, you'll bring up the document and uh, it will show you how to post an event or organize or checklist. So when you're running an event, these are all little things you can use. The one I wanna focus on today is this seventh one here. So trip planning spreadsheet template for outing organizers. Open the example of the Excel template and use it to plan your trip. So what you do is you just click on this link and it will open up um, basically uh, Excel file, which you can now save. So in my case, it's over here. So I go open and it's opening on my second screen, but I'll drag it over. So this is the Excel. So the first thing you have to do is to say, enable editing. And now it's popped back to my second screen. I'll drag it back over. So it will look something like this. And all you have to do is say file, save to somewhere. So what I did is I basically, when I did the file save, I just renamed the file and you know called it the Moisey River trip planning spreadsheet. Okay, so what you can do, it gives you an example and it's got all these sheets or they're called tabs. But what I usually do is I might, start the, the process of filling in this sheet. But then what I do is I load it to a Google Drive. 
And then that way everybody can access it. So that's what I plan to show you. So I'll just close these down and I'll bring up the Google Drive here. Oh, and, and feel free to, you know, jump in and ask a question if you want something answered. So I previously loaded a file, the file I was talking about, but I'll show you how to do this. Um, you go to Google and um, usually when you type in your Google, so this is the WCA account, um, basically there's these nine little Google apps and you look down, you can, you know, Gmail, you can do all this stuff, but this is the Google Drive. You click on this and you'll get this sheet. And on this sheet, if you wanted to add a spreadsheet to it, you say over here is a big plus sign, new. And you just say file upload. And you can give it a couple seconds and it's gonna ask you which file you want. So you would, you know, search around for the file and I know it's on the uh, desktop. And uh, we'd look around for the file. So there's the file I was playing with, you know, before. And I would say open, but in this case, I've already loaded it, so I won't do that. So this is the file I put uh, on a couple of days ago. So you double click on that and the spreadsheet is on the Google Drive, which means it's on like a cloud. Um, now the beauty here is you can give other people access to this drive. Um, and what I've done is I've given, I believe, Sandro access to the drive, yes. So there was two people, myself and Sandro. So uh, Sandro, if you're in the background there, have you yeah. got your drive open? Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so maybe Sandro, you could become Mary Smith and you know, maybe okay. I'm John Smith. And, I, and I'll just talk my way through what I did here. So there's all these tabs. The first tab is really people on the trip, you would create as many rows as you want and you would you know, color code it or whatever the way you want it. So John Smith's me and I just start going through it. Am I going on the trip? Yes, what's my email? I'm a male, 35 years old, my address, my phone number, my cell number, my OHIP number, my emergency contact, and you just kind of scroll over to the right here, emergency contact, um, you know, name, emergency contact, phone number, um, emergency contact, email. Um, and then some basic questions. Do you have swift water training? So we're doing a canoe trip. This could be anything. If you're winter camping, you could change that. Uh, first aid training, uh, list the trips you've been on, any medical uh, issues. Now, sometimes people do say none, but in private, they'll come to me and, you know, say I'm uh, allergic to bee stings or something. So I just note that. And then I say, okay, do you have an EpiPen? And, you know, where is your EpiPen? So in case you got stung and you were, you know, needed it, I could, you know, route around and get your EpiPen or something. So this is where the information would be valuable. Um, most people say they have, you know, knee issues or whatever issue they have. Because when you're on a, a trip, you want to know your, your limitations and stuff. And if you have any issues, um, any dietary, um, you know, issues, restrictions, I'm allergic to something. In my case, I just don't like artichokes. Uh, and then any car information because you're driving, you're leaving vehicles. Um, so you can just imagine things that can happen on a trip, um, you know, you have an issue where you have to cancel the trip midway. So you have cars at boat ends and you have to maybe relay some of the information to somebody. So now they know it, or you're on the trip and you're in transit and the other people that are in transit never met you, but now they know what your car looks like uh, or in your license plate. So when you say, I'll meet you at this Tim Hortons, they're looking for a Toyota, a RAD4, SUV, XYZ. Um, the same thing on a trip, uh, you're not, you're on the trip and you wanna call somebody. You've got, um, you know, the cell phone um, and the various pieces of information. So all these little pieces of information do come in handy on trips. 
Um, so the ideas of this planning spreadsheet is you populate it and you're using it to plan, but you're also could be using it on the trip. So the first sheet, a sheet is basically participation information. Um, the second sheet is um, basically um, travel plans on how to get to the start of the trip, but not specifically when you're on the river. So you got your you know, four or five people here, four people in this case. And John Smith sort of populating this, but we don't have the information for the other people. Um, so of course, it's a repeat of the first sheet in a way you're starting from, in my case, Whitby. I'm a driver, Mary Smith's coming with me. Uh, we have two canoes loaded on the canoe, on the, on the van or whatever, SUV. We're going to, you know, depart at this time. We're going to drive to Montreal. And the next day we're going to drive to Bay Como. So that's our plan. Maybe Jack Jones has a different plan. So in this case, Sandra Weaver, uh, Wiener is our, our new person. So he's populating this as we speak here. Um, so this is the beauty. He's remote. And Sandra, you're in Mississauga or something. I'm sitting in Whitby. Somebody else could be sitting in uh, the United States and we're populating this as we go along here, basically. Um, so the idea is you plan how you're gonna get there. When you're on the river, these dates, that's on a different sheet. So don't worry about that. Uh, on the way back, this is the plan. We're gonna find a motel, blah, 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 blah. And we did some research. I put a Google link here. So you can actually grab this link out of the cell. So you just grab this thing like this, copy it, uh, open a new you know, window. Um, here's an Ontario Google map thing. So I could just take the link here and paste it in the address. And let's see what happens. So this is on our way back from Bay Como, I guess. So. Uh, the plan was to drive back to Drummondville, which is in Quebec. And so this is my proposal to say, well, we'll, you know, drive from there to there. And it's going to take about nine and a half hours, according to Google. And if I zoom in, people now know, okay, this is the plan. This is what we're planning. You now the plans change, of course, but you could see, I put a Google thing all the way down to, yeah, there's the hotel. And, you know, if you click on the hotel, you'll get all the particulars about the old comfort in or whatever. And we'll talk about rates and stuff like that, phone numbers, you can call them, whatever. So because my company's based in France, I got this in euros here, but um, you can convert it from 78 euros to, you know, it's about 120 bucks. And this is the place. So, you know, that's kind of handy. Uh, so going back to the spreadsheet. Um, some, sometimes what I do is I put a link down here with, you know, the driving direction. So you can click on this same thing. You'll get a map of where our driving to the, um, Moise. Um, so you can do lots of stuff. You can do screen captures and stick it in there. So people understand what your plan is. Um, the next sheet is usually the menu and itinerary. So this one's a little color coded. And you start off with, on your trip, of course, you're gonna you know, change the dates. And, and usually the way I started is, okay, the minute I start driving, that's day one, and it's taking two days to get there, we're in transit. So we've got the day, um, the date, the date, the actual day of the week. And then this is like an itinerary of food. So we got like breakfast, describe the breakfast. So. Basically, the first breakfast is the person and what are they going to make? Um, now, on this trip, we had um, for the Moise trip, this is a copy of the Moise trip, we had six people. So this is all geared around six people, but I've revised it to you know, make it like into four people. Um, so the idea would be, you know, it's a shared group breakfast. This trip happened to be lunches individually. We'll make our own lunches. So some people want a granola, other people want something else, but basically they're not cooked lunches. They're on the river. It could be a beautiful day. It could be a, you know, a rainy day. So you don't want to spend a lot of time. It, it might be like 
generally a half an hour to 45 minute lunch. And then dinner, again, um, you pick somebody's name. Generally what happens is we try to do it. So it's like a rotation. So you'll see Jack, uh, John, Mary, Jack, Jill, John, Mary, Jack, Jill, you know, and that rotation keeps going. So the idea, this was a canoe. So the first day you'd basically eat through a breakfast and a supper. And generally what happens is we try to do it. So the canoe, this is the guy who's cooking, but the canoe mate, Mary in this case, would help prepare the fire and stuff like that. And then when Mary's cooking, John will be doing the fire and, you know, stuff like that. So it's kind of like you always have like a break basically. So you have one canoe working for that day and the next day, the next canoe works and it keeps rotating around and you can see the rotation. We've made John, you know, a certain color all the way through and we made Mary green and we made Jack blue and Jill is yellow. So there's like a color pattern there. And the idea would be you populate this sheet and this could be a few months before, and you can see what other people are bringing. So you go, hmm, I don't want, you know, 12 days of oatmeal. So I'll, you know, make eggs. Okay. And then maybe the last day I'll make oatmeal. So you kind of, you know, move your stuff around. Um, you know, if there's a day, this is the plan, but if there's a day like this day is pissing rain, this is too complicated to make, you just try to switch with somebody or you take one of your meals from down here, which was, you know, basic steel cut oats and you bring it up because it's just too complicated to make, uh, you know, eggs because it's a rainy day. And then of course we also have desserts. Desserts are not mandatory, but depending on the trip, this trip seemed to have a lot of people making desserts. Um, and then at the bottom of the sheet, we have the days on the river. So we basically have a plan here of whatever, 13 days, I guess. And Jen, what I do is I usually put down the mileage. So we started at 373 from the end. And then every day we did 39 clicks and this is the total left. So you can kind of see you're tracking down. And that way on the trip, this piece of paper that you're gonna print usually you would put it in the food barrel. So you'd have a master in one of the food barrels, you know, laminated or something or in a plastic. And every day people say, okay, who's for supper? And they just pull the sheet out and you go, oh, wow, what are we today? Well, we're on this day, Jack, your supper. And you're supposed to have veggie burgers and potatoes. So it's a good reminder. Or you'll end up switching it and you just put a little, you know, pencil mark and you switch over here or something. Um, so this is your, your kind of your plan, basically. Um, and that just counts down and scroll to the right, depending on how long your trip is. In our case, we had a 13 day on the river trip and you could see the mileage. So that was our plan. And then two days to get back home again in transit. So we're not too worried about cooking because we're eating on the road, basically. Um, you know, jump in if you have any questions, anybody. Um, Tents, okay, the next um, tab is number four, it's tents and canoe gear. Um, so this one is of course the people, again, it's just a cut and paste, canoe details. You know, what kind of canoe do you have? I have a deck cover. Okay, Mary's going with John, uh, Jack's got an echo and uh, you know, it's going with Jill. Uh, tents, uh, color helmet, uh, paddle, what are you bringing? So, you know, generally you like to have about three paddles per canoe. It's a tandem canoe, so you have a spare. Um, in some cases, some, you know, people bring whitewater paddles, of course, whitewater river, but they'll have their spare, but maybe they'll also like to have a flat water paddle because, you know, whitewater paddles are heavy. So that's another option. So we don't want to end up with, you know, four people and 12 paddles but we also want to make sure we have, you know, a spare or two just in case something uh, gets wiped out and we lose a paddle along the way. And then uh, another side of it is uh, throw ropes. That's good to list there by canoe. And uh, believe it or not, a lot of people go on trips and they forget their bailer. So I've added this column to say, uh, when you're doing your mental checklist at home, you go down, yeah, I got canoe, I got my tent, I got my helmet, I got my paddles, 
I got my throw rope. I got my bailer. Okay. I got all the gear for the canoe, you know? Uh, then we go on to the next tab. So this tab, uh, the whole spreadsheet uh, is done and imagining there's no Zoom call. Um, the last year or so when we've had trips, we've actually created Zoom calls. So we're actually go through the spreadsheet. So we're trying to populate it before the Zoom meeting. And then when we have the meeting, we actually go through and populate and, you know, and finish off the spreadsheet, usually in one or two Zoom meetings. But before Zoom meetings, we had this um, tab five, which was, you know, somebody had a question. Uh, so the first question from John was, general planning costs be paid by John, he will be reimbursed at the end of the trip. So that was like a statement almost. Uh, so John was the leader of this trip and he was gonna organize all the upfront costs like paying for a park pass, um, maybe arranging for a flight or a train ticket, stuff like that. So if there was any questions, um, you could list your question here. And as people were starting to review it, they would make their comments. So here's a good one. Um, so John, just to be clear, would be cooking over fires wherever, po whenever possible. Stoves will be used whenever the group feels it's necessary, i.e. rain and, you know, bad weather. So the idea there is to tell everybody we're going to have black pots because we're on open fires. So when people were reviewing it, Mary said, okay. And Jack said, okay. And Jill said, okay. So now, you know, we have like a buy-in. Okay. Somebody's not going to be upset if they get a black pot at the end of the trip. Uh, another question was fishing in fishing in Quebec is very controlled. Salmon fishing important on the river may not be an option. And then John says, I like the fish. And Jill says, I do not eat fish. And at the end of the day, uh, if you scroll to the right here, let's see if I can get over there. Let's see, how do I shrink this sheet here? There we go, right here. Make it 90%, nope, 75. Yeah. So at the end of the question and the comments from people, we have a conclusion. Okay, John will buy one fishing license for his personal use. So all these kind of questions get um, you know, reviewed by the people and at the end of the meeting, or in this case, these people didn't have a meeting, they just went through this sheet, they make a decision what to do. So that's what that tab's for. Uh, six assigned tasks. So this is a sheet where, you know, you don't want to put the load all on the leader. So people up front, you just say, write down in your assigned roles, what are you good at? What do you like to do? Somebody may be, I wanna wake up at four o'clock in the morning and make the fire and make coffee, uh, you know? So you just write down what you, what you like to do. Uh, so in this case, John Smith was the trip coordinator and I, he will manage the spreadsheet and organize the trip details. He'll be the trip lead. Uh, Mary Smith, I will coordinate medical and safety. Okay, you're the medical lead. So you kind of put this piece down and then as people are discussing it, you make the decision. Okay, Mary, you're in charge of anything medical. Anything medical that happens on the trip, minus yourself, um, you, it's your call on what we're going to do. You know, maybe Mary's a nurse or a doctor or something, you know. So you're, you know, you're using her skill set. Uh, Jack Jones, he's supposed to be good at in reach and he's going to bring all the kitchen gear in a barrel. Okay, great. And that was decided. I can organize. Okay, Jill is going to organize the shuttles and the hotels and good with maps. So she's going to be in charge of that. And you just kind of divide the task up to share the load basically. Uh, seven group gear. Um, because we don't want, um, you know, four people with, uh, you know, four pots and four saws and four tarps and, you know, four whatever. Uh, we want to share some gear. So we don't want to, you know, we want to be able to make the trip enjoyable that we're not poor over portaging gear and stuff. So we don't want to bring too little. And we don't want to bring too much. So this sheet is basically uh, a list of um, things, of group things. So one is pots barrels we need, dishes, fire irons, stoves, reflector oven, 
um, saws and foldable wash containers and gravity filters. So you go through it and you say, what do you have? So John doesn't have much, but he has a saw. He's got aqua tabs for emergency use. He's got a GPS, et cetera. And, you know, Mary's got lots of pots. She's got a barrel. She's got fire irons. She's got a stove. Uh, and she's got two liters of fuel she's suggesting to bring. And she's got a hand pump. So she might list a ton of stuff. And at the end of the day, you see what everybody has. And then you make a decision down here. You go, okay, Mary, we're bringing only your pots. And she'll make a list of the pots typically, you know, I got a 10 liter, a seven liter, a five liter and a fry pan. Okay, done. And then, yes, we got three barrels, two for food and one for gear. Done. That's what we're going to bring. Not four barrels, not two barrels, those barrels. And those people are in charge of bringing those barrels. And of course, John and Mary seem to be a couple. They're going to fill their 60 liter. And Jack Jones is going to put the gear in this barrel and Jill and Jack together are going to fill that 60 liter. And that should be enough food for the 13 or 15 days or whatever. And you just go through the whole process of, you know, pots and dishes and stoves. Generally, you try to bring two stoves and you try to bring two stoves of the same uh, model type, like they're burning white gas or propane or whatever. So that if one craps out, you know, you can use these two liters of fuel on this stove or this stove and make sure your stoves are working or your hand pumps or whatever. So in this case, we decided, okay, we're gonna bring aqua tabs as backup and we're gonna have a gravity filter for the group and we'll have one hand pump. So if the gravity filter craps out, we have the hand pump and the aqua tabs if vice versa, we'll have the gravity filter or worst case, we have the aqua tabs. Uh, tarps, we're gonna bring one tarp and we're gonna bring this much rope, great. Bear banger, Mary's gonna bring her bear banger. And you just scroll along and you can add columns if you want of other things that you think are important. Um, then you move on to eight. Um, so tab eight is more, it's all about depinning stuff. Um, so generally on a, on a serious river, you want to have a depinning kit per canoe. And the issue there is if canoe A gets pinned, generally that equipment maybe is not accessible or the people are floating down the river and the canoes in the middle of the river stuck somewhere. And so you have to rely on canoe B's depinning kit because you just can't get to canoe A at this point. So that was the idea there. So if you had like three canoes, four canoes, generally you try to have, you know, two or three depinning kits. So more than one, because the worst case scenario is you could have the canoe with the depinning kit stuck in the middle of the river somewhere and you just can't get to it. And um, you do want a deep pinning kit. So one of the things I do is I make sure I have all the gear that we need divided up. I also, I print the sheet and laminate it and stick it in my deep pinning kit in a, in a plastic bag because you have to deep pin like once in a blue moon, you forget. So it's good to have a guide to say, okay, this is how you do a three to one this is how you do a five to one, you know, et cetera. So you have this little guide that just rambles through, you know, here's a three to one, here's a six to one, and here's a nine to one ratio. And of course, you're going to try just pulling with a rope, a one to one, and that's not enough power. Okay, now you're going to put a three to one. Okay, that's not enough. And you're going to put a six to one. And then just general, you know, knots to use when you're tying straps together or lines together. It's not so much to tie them together, the knot. The knot is really, a, a good knot is you can get it apart when you're finished the job. Um, you can always make a knot that the ropes will stay together, but with that much load, the knot gets so tight, it's almost impossible to get it apart unless you have a knot that's you know set up to take apart basically. So it's good to follow 
you know, standard knots like figure eights and stuff like that um, to actually be able to get it apart after reefing on it with a thousand pounds. So that's number eight. Number nine tab is all about emergency numbers. So before the trip, we start listing everything that we know. We got the hotel, we got a backup hotel, we got the put in coordinate, we've got the takeout. It's um, a ZEC campsite where they had a telephone number, an address, you know, postal code and GPS. The local police is Certe Quebec um, in Quebec. Uh, the shuttle person, I just put a fictitious number there, but that's his email. Um, the Quebec search and rescue number, maybe a helicopter service, hospitals. You could have different hospitals. One could be at the around the put in and one could be at the takeout area. Uh, trains, um, taxi services, so taxi and set deal. Um, you know, for some reason, you, you know, our cars are not there. They're supposed to be shuttled down there. But uh, CAA, you finally get your car and there's a problem with it. Um, you know, some outfitters uh, on the river, around the river. So you list a few of those. The Bay Como police. Uh, this is around the put in Fermont. Oops, get down there. Fermont police. Uh, so Hopefully you never have to use any of these numbers. The only number we actually use is this Toby guy here, which we actually in reached him to say, we are too fast. We're ahead of schedule. Can you bring the cars to the end sooner? And that actually worked. So we had a plan. We're going to do it in 17 days. We ended up doing it in 13 days. So this is the only number we had to access to make an in reach call to the guy, you know, by text. Uh, and it worked out fine. Um, so generally the only numbers I've had to use in the past is uh, with the you know air service or with a shuttle driver service because generally I'm faster than I think I was going to be. So that's the emergency list. Uh, you can also put your um, your uh, garden angel on there. And I forgot to mention that, but in the beginning here, if I go back to the beginning, let me see if I can get back there. Let's see, how do I get back there? No, that's how you do it. You drag. Oh. Okay. Uh, oh, can't get back there for some reason. Oh, here we go. It's a little different on Google. You notice the last person here had a garden angel. So that would be somebody that's at home base. If you have some issue where... Um, you know, I don't know what it could be, but let's imagine we had a guardian angel and went to uh, the blood vein. There was a lot of fires in Manitoba, Ontario border. And that guardian angel, when we'd send an in reach message, if there was a fire pretty close, he would send an in reach message to, a message to us saying there was a fire at this coordinate and we would know where it is. And, you know, one was like 10 K away, but still, uh, if there was a fire, like, you know, very close to our route, he could write that back to us. So that was handy. Or the garden angel also gets the in reach messages. He could actually talk to shuttle drivers and stuff that's saying they're ahead of schedule. Can you pick them up, you know, earlier or something, you know, things like that. So that's kind of handy to have sometimes. So let's get back to, okay, we're at the rescue. Okay. Number nine, we said the safety. And then number 10 is first aid equipment. So it's a list. Uh, do you have a basic kit? Do you have a deluxe kit, uh, drugs, waterproof container, and any common? So the four people, okay, this guy has a deluxe and this person has a basic and a basic and Jill's gonna share with Jack, I guess. And he just, you know, you have some comments. I have basic personal stuff and band-aids, you know. I have a, and Jill has a tooth repair kit because she's a doctor say, and you know, that's handy. Okay. Uh, I will make a kit up. So, you know, it's just general thing to get people aware, you know, bring some first aid equipment. Generally I find all the first aid issues are uh, fire related. I burnt my hand 
I cut my hand because when I was sawing a cracked piece of wood and I got a splinter, it's all geared around that generally. Sometimes people ask me for an aspirin because they got cooked a bit, you know, it was too hot and they didn't drink enough. Um, Benadryl sometimes, they got a bug bite. Uh, do you have any Benadryl? Yes, I have Benadryl, here it is, stuff like that. So um, the basic first aid kit, you know, has those basic things in it and you can kind of beef it up with your own aspirin and whatever, Motrin, whatever you need, uh, anti-acid. And you just label everything or make sure it's in the original packaging so you understand what's there. Uh, so this is a good way to say, okay, I think we've got enough first aid stuff. Uh, repair kit. This is kind of like inside generally my first aid kit. And this is important because every trip we go on, there's something breaks. And Sandro, you were on a trip, right? Yep. And what did we break? Or what did I break? <laughs> <laughs> new seat. Right. Yeah, I leaned back on the seat, so I had all my weight on one board, and it snapped. <laughs> yeah. And so one thing we really needed and we used was uh, wire. So bring like some 16, 18, 20-gauge wire, uh, you know, a couple meters. Uh, it's very easy to roll up a couple meters. Um, same with Gorilla Tape. Uh, you can, you know, wire back the wood and then gorilla tape it so it's the wires covered. Um, I've broken seat threaded rods before. Uh, just from the wiggling, they get wiggly and they snap because of fatigue. I've also, sometimes you got to take your, your, your canoe apart to nest them and you lose something. So it's good to have, you know, a couple threaded inch threaded rods, three, 30 seconds. They're like six inches long with some nuts. Uh, they're not as good as a screw because you have a nut sticking up now, but it will get you out of a pinch. So I've used that before. Um, if you have, um, you know, some issue where you have a hole in your boat and it's leaking, uh, you bring some two-part epoxy in a little 250 milliliter squirt thing or two vials you can combine. Uh, I'll give you a, one trip. I was on the Snake River and the guy's paddle delaminated on day one. So his paddle looked like that. <laughs> so what we did is we cleaned it all up. We put the epoxy in and we sat it on a rock and piled a bunch of rocks on top of it. Five minute epoxy. And uh, an hour later, we came back and it was all glued back together with the epoxy oozing out any which way. And we just took another, you know, granite rock and used it as a sanding thing. And we basically sanded his paddle back into, you couldn't tell it was broken. And it just, over time, it dried up and it just split. So the, just the laminations came apart. So that was very handy. Um, if you have a bigger repair job, a little container to mix the epoxy in, a spreader, some gloves like those vinyl gloves things you can put on there throw away so you don't get all sticky with epoxy uh fiberglass cloth, cloth i just bring a little piece and again it's you got a big little hole in the boat at least you have something to patch it with uh wet and dry sandpaper aqua seal you know or shoe glue uh sometimes i've used that stuff on airbags they keep deflating so you go into the lake you find out where the hole is you aqua seal the hole and the next day it's perfectly fine. I've also had air match, sleeping air mattresses deflated, put them back in the lake, find where the hole is and you know, mark it. And then the next day you do it when you get to camp. And then a couple hours later, you can use it actually, but I usually leave it for the next day to use it. Uh, epoxy roll is basically just like you need these two epoxy, um, materials together and it makes like an epoxy cement basically uh leather all with wax thread that's a like an awl that you can and we've used that before too to fix uh, straps on packs every trip almost we break a strap on a pack somewhere uh, somebody dragging a pack or it's too heavy they grab it by one strap and just pull it right off because you know it the threads rot with time and uh, weather and water and stuff like that 
And then, um, so all this stuff is really just a handful of stuff. Uh, I guess the gorilla tape is the bulk of it, uh, 15 meters, but I just kind of flatten that. So it all goes into a, like a little package, basically, is my, my repair kit. And then, of course, you need a couple tools. So a multi-tool with you know, pliers on it is ideal. Uh, a little stubby screwdriver with a bunch of bits. So you don't have to bring all the bits, but bring the bits that match with your canoe and your gear. So generally a Phillips screwdriver uh, slotted, you know, it's, it, the bits are just little bits. So they'll, the screwdriver is only this long and the bits are all in the head of the screwdriver. And then scissors and scissors are usually are in your medical kit. So I just put it there as, cause you need scissors to do the uh, uh, fiberglass cloth cutting and stuff like that. But generally people have knives and scissors, so it's not a big issue. So I just kind of listed here all the things you can do with all this stuff. Uh, but this is generally what we bring on a trip. And again, we try to divide it up so it's not all in one boat. Um, and then the final um, page, which is quite helpful, is our finance page. And all this is is a little spreadsheet where you have the four people. And these cells, you kind of, you know, if you have something else, you just click on the cell and do a right click and say insert row and you create another row basically. Um, and so what happens here is people put in what they paid and then this gives you the sum. So this row, the sum is five bucks. So here's two people paid 30, 30, sum is 60. This person, so you can see John Smith paid for most stuff, right? Uh, the in-reach fee, uh, he paid some cash to Stephanie in Vermont. Uh, he paid the shuttle. Uh, he bought some t-shirts for the group. He paid for all the hotel, except for these two here. Um, he bought some, you know, various things for cooking for the group. Uh, the deep pinning kit, he had to do something, uh, incidentals. So at the end of the day, all of these add up to he spent 29.16 that he paid. Mary, 35 bucks she paid. Jack paid uh, whatever this is, 141. And Jill paid 146. So the whole trip, you add up all these four and it gives you 32, 39 for the trip, or you can go this way. So that means we have four people 32, 39 divided by four, everybody should pay 809. And you could see Jack paid 29.16 and he should have paid 809. So he's really owed 2106. So we made it in red. Um, Mary uh, should have paid 809, but she only paid 35. So she owes the difference 774. Um, Jack should have paid 809, but he only paid 141. He goes 668, you know, and etc. So what happens is the people that owe, if you add up these three, they'll equal this. Now, one more thing is there was deposits, deposits given to Jack. So each person paid 350 bucks deposit in the beginning of the trip and gave it to Jack. So really, um, Jack was owed 2106, but we did pay him 1,050 bucks up front. So we really only owe him the difference now, which is 1,056. Same thing here. Um, you know, I, you know, this person owes 774. They did pay a deposit, so they owe less. Same thing, less, less. So when you add up the three people that owe, 300, 300, 400, that all adds up to 1,000. So these people would pay Jack, basically. And this is a great way to end the trip. So on the last day, typically everything's known. You just populate this. Or when you come back, the first thing you come back, you know, if anybody missed anything, you have a time to critique this. And you basically say, okay, everybody pay, send an e-transfer to Jack or John Smith. So 313.09, 3, and everything gets squared away. And generally I like to do e-transfers 
because now you have a record forever. Uh, you know, it's on your bank. The guy pushing the button has got it. So if somebody says, hey, did you pay me for the Moise trip? And I go, I don't know. I can't remember. I'll go back. So I go back to, you know, whatever, September last year. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, I paid you 313 and, and there it is, you know. So generally, I try to do that e-transfer because you have a, a data track of the thing versus, you know, just say, yeah, you remember I gave you 20 bucks at the gas station? And it was going, no, I don't remember anything. I mean, it's all a blur now. So I would highly recommend when you get to the end of the trip, you just e-transfer the money over to people. That's the, the best way to do it in my mind. All right, so we'll go back to um, stop sharing. And if anybody has a question, um, either Sandra or myself can maybe answer. Got one more question. Yeah, Kathy. So you mentioned that people just tend to put in their assigned roles or do you tend to set up roles for people to take on? Um, like I if think you think it, of all the jobs yeah. that have to be done, yeah. you list I them think, first and then people. Yeah, if you know somebody, like I know Sandro, so Sandro's really good at maps. So I would say, you know, hey, Sandro, can you do the maps? Because he likes doing mm -hmm. the maps. It's, you know, it's what he likes to do, right? Uh, I'm really yeah. good at, I like maps. I like in reach, you know, GPS stuff. So I'll do the GPS stuff and it's all interrelated, right? Cause Sandra would have to use GPS to come up with the route, but I would, you know, maybe help them. Or if you have say, um, you know, medical person, you say, can you do all the medical stuff? <laughs> um, or if you have somebody that likes cooking, uh, can you be in charge of, you know, pushing the, 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 the menus and stuff and saying, Hey, we got too much oatmeal. We got too much, you know, whatever, cakes, I don't know. So it's yeah. kind of like, depending on the crowd, if you don't know somebody on the crowd, and the WCA is beautiful that way. We've had Americans come on trips. We go, okay, who is, um, you know, who's Yadimir? I don't know. Okay, uh, so Yadimir is going to write down all the stuff that he is good at. And we'll try to, you know, slot everybody, because we want to keep everybody, we want to share the load, right? The leader doesn't have to do everything. Leaders trying to coordinate right. a little bit. And even the leadership, you try to share that a bit. Um, sometimes you have guy or people that are very good at whitewater. Hey, you're making calls on, are we running this? You know, and they might say, this is too dangerous. We got like, we got a class two or three, and then as a waterfall, <laughs> you know, you're going to really rely on their expertise to say, this is pushing our limits, you know, um, you know, and nobody can tell you to run something, but generally you would try to, you know, assign somebody with lots of experience for safety to say, you know, we're out here. The nearest road is like two days away. It's, you know, it's dicey if we're going to run this thing. If it goes wrong, it really goes wrong, you know, and that wrecks everybody's trip. If you lose one boat, it really is a downer. Yeah. Or you get it stuck. You know, I had a boat stuck for three and a half hours. I mean, it really sucks up the day uh, okay. and it's stuck like eight feet from me, <laughs> but I just can't get to it because <laughs> the water is rushing so fast and it's so deep, you know. Mm -hmm. We so, actually did it overnight. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. There's a, we're stuck on, there's a, I wrote something for the Nostog and we're pinned on the White River. But we managed to get it, get it up. I will actually read about how we did it, but uh, <laughs> It, uh, it was something that didn't even look that bad, but, yeah. you know, we should, should have avoided it, not because where I got stuck, because we, if you get through that, it was a rock garden further down anyway you had to get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but the, a point of white water, you tend to get carried away. If you keep going, you're going, oh, that last one looked worse than it was, but it was okay. Then you do yeah. the next one, you do the next one. It's a different, it's different between being, having a base camp be, beside rapids where you're practicing and you're in the middle of a trip. Mm -hmm. So you have to have contingency plans, maybe carry the gear and go without the gear or something like that, because it's much easier to get the canoe off the rocks. If you, and uh, you gotta look, look for pinning situations. Getting a dunk and, and a swim, no problem. But the pin is uh, not, not something you wanna do. 
Okay. And, and Sorry, it's sometimes Jim. very, it's just a little mistake you made and all of a sudden it escalates into, oh my God, now we're wrapping. Now we're like a, you know, U shape. Oh my God, we got no tree to pull on. We, you know, that's going to be a tough one, you know? <laughs> and then all of a sudden that boat pops right off and you're like sweating it and it's like it's floating again. Or, oh my God, how do we get to it? You know, uh, you know, those kind of things. So it's, there's all kinds of scenarios and yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, they happen once in a blue moon, but, you know, they can happen to anybody and you have to be prepared. And that's just one aspect. I mean, most of the stuff is just um, you break things uh, like we broke a yoke on the Moisey and we, you know, just like the seat, we fix the yoke and not having a yoke. That would be brutal. I don't know how you carry the canoe without a yoke, you know. So yeah, we basically splinted it with wire and another piece of cedar and, you know, put the padding on and off we went again and, you know, Neil didn't complain, but, you know, you try to look at your gear and say everything's in good shape, but you know, anything can break, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's just dropping a pack on the yoke and that did it, you know, or you flip the boat up and you hit a big bump or something on the hill and just cracked it because you got 80 pounds up there bouncing around. Um, so I don't know exactly what happened, but that's what happened. Um, but I mean, that's just Agreed. specific stuff. <laughs> Sorry. It's like anything, this planning sheet, uh, the more you can plan up front, the trips generally go well. Mm. And if there's an issue, at least you have a plan, right? You had yeah. a deep pinning plan. You had a um, cooking you know, issue. You lost one of the you know barrels with some you know equipment in it like you try to divide the equipment up to uh pots and stuff we i know we had i think jeff you know the people that lost like an equipment barrel and all their all their pots and everything in a one barrel uh i don't recall that yeah. uh there was somebody that, that did that Okay, uh, Cliff Jacobson says, "Don't keep everything in one pack." Right, mind right. you, uh, uh, you got to think about certain things like, uh, well, the pots we want to nest them, so you want to nest one, them, you yeah. lose them all. Yeah, it's a right. tough one. But um, what yeah. if you had a separate coffee pot? That could be somewhere else because in an emergency, you can cook all your meals in your coffee yeah. pot. Things yeah. like that. Uh, no thing like to think it. about. Yeah, it would be yeah. difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be difficult, but you can manage. It. You can do it you somewhere. Or, yeah. Or you, or yeah, you it'd be or like if you lost a in a metal plate. food barrel. At least you have one food barrel. You can probably make it, you know, because the Moise, you're remote, but you get to places that are fly in on the river. So you could make it to some place and buy your, you know, that's the other thing, have some cash on you to buy some food, you know, from one of these camps or something. So try to come up with a scenario is if I lost a boat, if I, you know, if I lost a barrel, if I lost this, uh, you know, I think I could, you know, wing it. So this is all part of the trip planning spreadsheet is to get you in the mindset <clears throat> that you're planning ahead. And, you know, like some of us have done lots of trips, little things happen and you realize, oh, I should have asked that on the spreadsheet uh, or whatever, right? Um, yeah, one of the funny things I had, this is a, going back like 15, 20 years, I had pretty green people who went on the Petawawa and I asked a bunch of questions. One of them was, can you swim? And one of the guys answered on the spreadsheet, and I, I looked at it after the fact because he said, I have a knowledge of swimming. Now, he was a foreign guy from probably the Middle East somewhere. So, you know, someplace with not a lot of water, probably. And after the fact, on the last day, he did all the rapids, everything was okay. But he was at the McManus Lake and we were just swimming. And he stepped off like a little shoal where it went to six foot. And you can see the panic. And somebody grabbed him, pulled him back to, he's on the ground again. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, can you swim? And he had no life jacket on, of course. He was just wading in the water, right? On the rapids, he had a life jacket on, and I think he did wipe mm -hmm. out a few times, but he was fine. He was floating. But it's yeah. that one time he was just swimming with no life jacket. You know, he had this panic look. And mm -hmm. I asked him, can you swim? He says, I'm pretty okay. <laughs> but I could tell he was like panic, right? He was like, <gasps> you know, 
And I looked in the sheet well, and he says, I have a knowledge of swimming, which I thought was a language barrier thing, which meant he really cannot swim. He watched the Olympics once. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it's also course. the difference between whether yeah. someone can swim in a pool versus a lake right. with dark yeah. water. Yeah, it's a little different, scarier. Uh, there was one other incident I had. The lady on the sheet, the same sheet I use, it was a... Um, the lady, you know, nice lady. Um, she told me she can't swim. I said, that's fine. Just wear your life jacket all the time. We were kayaking. Uh, no, actually we were canoeing. We were on the, on the, um, on the, uh, not the French river. The, what's the next one down? Um, the curl. What's the next the one curl? down from the, the, the curl or make another one? The mic? Uh, no, one down from the French, not key. One up from key. Um, oh, the can't curl? remember the name. What was that? Um, pickerel's remember. right there. Huh? Pickerel, pickerel. Yeah, we're on the pickerel. Yeah, we're all safe. We were going down <laughs> some lost channel. Uh, and what happened one morning, everything is really slick. And she was getting some water. She had no life jacket on. She was, we're just not even moving yet. We're on land. And she slipped into the lake. But it dropped off into 10 foot of water. And with her, with her water pump and everything. And her water pump went, and she's climbing on the walk. And she's, you can see the scratch marks on the rock. So we ran over and grabbed her, but we knew she couldn't swim. But it just showed you being that close to water and it's so slick on Georgian Bay. She just slipped right in the lake on this, you know, granite rock stuff. And you can just see the scratch marks in there. <laughs> she's sliding over. But, you know, she didn't go under. She was still hanging on. Mm -hmm. It was very slick. Um, but that's the things that can happen. But we actually asked the question on the spreadsheet twice to say, mm -hmm. can you swim? And I knew she couldn't swim. So I said, just wear yeah. a life jacket. But that was a scenario. Um, you know, it, it's helpful to have that information. Um, sure. well, yeah, I was going to ask Sandro to do some demo, but basically once you got the spreadsheet on Google Drive, Anybody can access as long as you give them the email with that shared, uh, you know, you say share off the top here. So I should bring that up. Yeah, it, it's good to have as well. The, uh, we, I started using Gary spreadsheet a long time ago. It's an excellent tool. Plus, when we have a lot of people planning on the same trip, like eight people, it's a lot of information we need to organize. Mm -hmm. uh, a good advice is to have a, a spreadsheet manager a person who is going through all the spreadsheet and something goes wrong, that person contact the person. Now, Yuri's on the call. I see his name down there. When we do trips with Yuri, Yuri's our spreadsheet Nazi. Yes. <laughs> so he's on there saying, Gary, you didn't fill in line, whatever, or tab, whatever. And it's important to have somebody coordinating that because you want to poke people to, to fill it in. I don't know if you're going to jump in. I'm here. Yeah. Did you want to highlight anything about the spreadsheet? No, it's good. You've done a great job. Excellent. So the idea now is because various people have used the spreadsheet, we're trying to you know get the club to use it. Even other clubs have used it. Um, and you could change it to winter camping or bicycling or whatever you want to come up with you might only need a few of those tabs because you know you don't have tents and you don't have maybe food and you know travel plans yes so you know you could simplify by just deleting those sheets you don't need or modifying them um i try to keep it so that you know on the screen you can see the information instead of making a massive spreadsheet on one sheet uh, and try to keep the information in one area so uh, obviously, the name has to replicate every sheet, but, you know, don't ask this, the guy's email 10 times. You ask it once and it's done, you know, so. Yeah, and the separate tabs is good because if you're looking at it on a phone or something, because a lot of the yeah. times you're opening it up on a mobile phone and yeah. I do find, because I have seen the one where it's all on one yeah. spreadsheet too, yeah. and it yeah. can be hard to you. Yeah, so uh, the yeah, idea was, back. yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Going back to one point when you're talking about someone who's shy about issues that they have medical issues. Yeah. You should not be shy about what medications you have, because if you have to be uh, 
medevaced, they have to know what medications you have so that they know not to give you something that conflicts or if you're laid up, you know what to give you. So what, what uh, medications, uh, quantity and um, milligrams and whatever, and how, how often you take them. Yeah, right, so. I, I totally agree. We, we normally, well, if we do, uh, a lot of people, they don't want to share on the spreadsheet. They have a problem, a physical or medical problem. Typically, send a separate email for each person just to know if they have a problem. If they want to share, at least we ask to share with the, the Canoop uh, partner. At as long least as somebody someone knows. knows. Someone, as long as yeah. somebody knows. Okay. Yes. Someone has to tell the uh, medivac yes. people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, give you another example. Uh, Jeff, you were on this trip. We did the Chapelo and we had a guy having a heart attack on day five. Uh, I yeah. think the whole process started on day one or two, but he really was having a heart attack on day five. And, you know, he got sent off by a helicopter. And our trip basically, we could have, you know, reversed our way back five days back to Chapelo, but the trip got canceled basically. And we bailed out at okay. the train stations. <laughs> And, yeah, I remember that. But That's the again, we that. had the information, so we had to call the outfitter to have a new plan to pick us up, coordinate the rail thing. Um, also, because this guy went off, Larry, we had to call his wife, so we had that, that information. So it all came in handy. We had phone numbers. We had OPP in Chapel Oak. We actually talked to the OPP in, in Chapel Oak before with the trip and said, here's all our information. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it really, it happens every so often, um, but it's amazing. Like, you know, you feel good because now you got a plan. People know about it. Everybody's got the information. And when something happens, you just pull the sheet out and say, okay, I know who to call. Here's the OPP. Here's the orange guy. Here's this, you know, and you just start rambling through. You don't, you're not in some remote spot and saying, who can I call? <laughs> You've got a number or two. You know, and that's how that was well executed. Was yeah, between yeah, you was. and uh, and Gary James, he knew Gary James is a police a, a police officer who was still active at the time. We had yeah. another six months ago. We were actually at a fishing lodge when we made the call. We had to paddle over to uh, uh, Elsass be, to be picked up because that's where the the field. That's a whole story in itself. Yeah. <laughs> Almost hit the field on fire. Yeah, but. <laughs> Uh, actually, we weren't sure if he's having a heart attack. The, the real problem was he had a electrolyte imbalance. Yeah, which uh, yeah. which which made made it seem like he it did have a pain, but we didn't know if it was uh, the heart or muscular or skeletal because it seemed to invoke by moving. So, well, let's not take any chances. Let's uh, yeah. get medevac. And well, uh, it was it was funny because he's talking on the phone, and you could hear the lady on the other side talking back, like he's explaining, you know, and she's asking questions. And basically, I, what I heard from the phone receiver, because he's got it open, because there are, you know, there are people listening. He says, basically the lady says, sir, you're having a heart attack. <laughs> so that was a statement that came off the phone. <laughs> We're saying okay, orange. The... We okay, walk out well... of the fishing lodge <laughs> and we know the helicopter's coming. We just gave him a coordinate. We walk out and we say, there is not enough room to land a helicopter here. I mean, you got like, what, 20 meters to the water? Not even, 15 meters to the water, trees everywhere. And I go, we go back in, make the call again, saying we got to move to this LSAS, which is three, four K away, which has a big open area because one of the guys on our trips did this river 25 years before as an MNR, you know, guy who cuts the brush and everything and says 25 years ago, there was an open field there. <laughs> so, but it's better than where the, the lodge was. We had nowhere to land a helicopter. Oh. Um, so we moved to Elsa and then gave the new cordon. Of course, the chopper has the old cordon in it, and you could hear it flying like 3K away. And eventually they found us in the field and it all worked out and Larry was okay. But yeah, it was a challenge. Yeah, Gabby, unfortunately, uh, you can be in a situation where you're, you're really messed up because. Uh, a lot of these uh, trips, is, these uh, orange helicopters do not have pontoons. 
Yeah. And even if they did, they, they may not be able to get on the river where you are. It's just rapids, rocks, too narrow. They can't land. Yeah. You got a problem. Yeah. I think they would have you, to hoist it, have to, but that would be a lot of effort. Right now, I, they I, land I in know. a few minutes. They circle around, make sure it's safe. They land. They get out. They put Larry in the hello with, you know, 20 wires coming out of him. And off they go, like 10, 15 minutes later. If they had to hover Actually, there, yeah. Cliff Jacobson has another story how he got a, a sick woman out. And in, in the, at the end of his uh, in the epilogue, he regrets doing it the way he did it. So I'll leave that up to in case you want to. We'll wait for the next to, uh, you know. yeah, talk. Yeah, He's we got one more coming in January. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, anybody else have any other comments about the planning spreadsheet? I might make one comment, uh, something that can't be covered by the spreadsheet, but uh, when the WCA has someone mount a trip who is a trip leader, uh, you've already brought up the situation of that trip leader should know um, all the medications that everybody that's on the trip is, is you know, taking. But uh, there's also a real ad hoc way of organizing trips. And for example, uh, depending on like, well, I think the perfect example is the thing Gary brought up by, you know, someone comes on the trip who actually can't swim. That's not mentioned anywhere on the spreadsheet. Um, I know the first trip I ever did with the WCA, I did it with Gary James and Gary actually interviewed me. He had me come to his house and he went through, you know, the whole sort of goals of the trip and all that. And, you know, I was un not under the impression that I was on the trip. I was being interviewed. Um, one of the questions I know from my background in outdoor education was uh, when you have a trip with people on it, sometimes you literally ask them to have a medical. And if you're doing a trip, uh, say a far north trip, that might be a reality with someone who's older, someone who's diabetic, um, to actually get a doctor to sign off saying, yeah, this person is fit enough to do this trip. And I think the spreadsheet doesn't cover little things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a big trip and you can really wreck people's trip. Like if people know you're, you know, like we've always, you know, we have a range of people and some people have better skills than others. If you know up front, you can offset a bit, right? You team them up with a stronger person, uh, you know, whatever, you know, uh, or they, they can't stern. Okay. We'll give you a stern person or whatever. So yeah, it's an important thing. I didn't put it on this spreadsheet, but I've had it on previous spreadsheets about, you know, can you swim? But it, the spreadsheet's beauty because you could take it, you can add a column, you can add a row, you can do whatever you want. You can add a tab if something is totally forget it. The idea is come up with a plan before, you know, distribute it, get everybody's input. It makes everybody feel part of the organization when they're doing that too. It's not like, you know, jamming it down your throat or something. If you if you want to, you know, you mentioned about, you know, being on the same wavelength, generally in the description of the trip, we'll say something like, uh, we're going to go at, you know, 5k an hour paddling, we're going to paddle six hours a day, we're going to, you know, so up front, you can see the menu um, itinerary section gives you like the mileage per day. Generally, when I'm planning a trip, I look at it. And, you know, I have this complicated thing in the background. I know how long it takes to do a portage. I know, you know, depending on the distance, it's, you know, whatever, a minute every 50 meters or whatever it is. And you could come up with, okay, there's an eight hour day, but we only did like 10 K, but we did like three K a portage, you know? And the next day is we did 25 K, but only one portage, you know, or we scouted a rapid or whatever it is. So you, you kind of judge like you don't overdo the trip. So it's all planning. The more planning you do up front, when the trip actually happens, I think it's gonna work out better because you're doing more research and you're, you're planning it out. You're not overdoing it. You're not underdoing it uh, in theory. So, I mean, it's, it's a trade-off. Like I tend to plan more than maybe most people, but the trips generally kind of work out. Um, Yuri, you're probably in a planning mode too. And I think Sandro, you know, you do quite a bit of planning. I might suggest 
that uh, the board consider actually putting together a document um, for the point of sending it to trip leaders saying, look, you know, you should be looking at these things, make sure you've covered them. Yeah. Yeah, like a checklist. When I yeah, like when a checklist, I mount, yeah. Well, when I've mounted trips before, you know, Bill Ness, he's, he's very good at pointing out some of the odd things. Like when I was looking at the Moisey originally, Bill, uh, he flagged the whole idea of fishing on the Moisey, saying, you know, you can get some in real trouble if you just sort of take a rod, um, you know, and just stuff like that. Bill's really helpful. But, uh, you know, this whole thing about swimming, medications, uh, if someone is is got uh, any kind of history of medical issues, like have they got a doctor to sign off that they're actually fit? These are things that the WCA board could put on maybe a, a one-sheeter, but just send it off to trip leaders. On And I'm not talking about a trip like the, you know, the Credit River. I'm talking about something that's, you know, far north. Yeah, we do have a checklist. If you go back to that um, page I mentioned and showed you, there is a checklist there. Um, so I think we've taken an attempt to that. Let me share my screen again here and I'll go back to that. Uh, there's some good links there. There's also a screening spreadsheet as well or a screening. Yeah, yeah. so if you click on these links and then they can click these, guidelines for organizers. So we just updated these documents, um, how to post a trip, that's old. I'm gonna update that, it's got the old logo on it. And I know we're making some little website changes in the next week or so. Um, so when that happens, then I'll be able to update that thing. Uh, organize your checklist, I think is what you're talking about. If you click on that link, so I can do it right now, just to give you an idea what's there. It's about a two pager, I believe. So organize your checklist, you know, you write down some stuff. And here's exactly what you just mentioned here. Participant skill level appropriate to the trip. Uh, we could probably add in their health <laughs> also, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, are, there, are their health up to speed? So the person that put this together was Bill and Tom. Uh, and I kind of looked it over. Uh, we just changed it because obviously we had a list, but now COVID has kicked in. So we had to add some COVID stuff here about have you signed the waiver? Uh, have you, you know, declared your COVID free and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then all this, you know, standard stuff, roles assigned and agreed, emergency contact information, travel arrangements, trip menu, cooking, stove, you know, et cetera, shuttle drivers, boats. This is a lot of stuff that's right on that spreadsheet I just mentioned. Critical yeah. equipment, of course. And, you know, like any list, it's just a guideline to get you rolling. You can add stuff to it, right? That's why we left blanks here. You know, whatever specific on your trip comes up. It's, it's a guideline to make you think. And then uh, obviously at the end of the trip, any incidents, a doc document, uh, trip log. So generally I try to do a presentation and even if I don't do a presentation, I, I really like to go over my thing and say, oh, here's my plan. Here's what I actually did. And I make a list of hours, start, finish, per day, mileage. And I come up with a little spreadsheet. And the idea then is that little Excel spreadsheet, somebody says, I want to do the Moisey. Okay, here's my maps. Here's my GPS. And here's my, my you know, how fast I went. And I said, yeah, it was a, you know, casual day or whatever I wrote down or it was raining but that gives you so much guideline because he says oh Gary did 50k on this day and that's because the river was going 10k an hour that's why I can do 50 you know it was zero effort the boat just went and there wasn't many rapids so we just got paddling and within eight hours we had 50k or the next day we only did 20k so that little spreadsheet is very helpful for the next person doing the river so we just made this on November 25th. So if you wanted to review those kind of things, um, and there's other stuff, screening of you know various trips, trip ratings, and uh, outing organizer accreditation, you know, blah blah blah. And this is the one we're talking about now, seven. Uh, I think in the future when I update how to post an event, I'm going to work on that one just to show people how to do it. It's pretty self-explanatory when you click on stuff. 
Um, so if you're logged in, you know, you can go down here and uh, submit an outing. And, and we're just going to change this in the next week or two. So we might have submit an outing for members and submitting an outing for members and, you know, outside people, guests, basically. If you want to open it up to the general population where you don't have to be a member to go on a trip. Um, you could be a, a guest person. So I think we're, we're just on the verge of creating that link and should be ready in a few weeks. So once that's ready, then I'll create the new uh, sheet on how to you know, post an event. And basically the advantage is anybody who's a member can post an event. Generally what happens is our, our outings committee will get the event and they'll read it and approve it. Um, so if you, you know, Joe Blow said, I'm going to make an event, I'm going to climb, uh, you know, whatever, you know, some mountain that, you know, they're way out of their range, you know, Bill and Mary would say, uh, is this in your capability? Um, or if you said, uh, I've never done whitewater, I'm going to do the Moise River. Yeah, you're going to scratch your head. Well, that's pushing it, I'd say, you know, start with a credit maybe, you know, or something. So they kind of review it and and, you know, give people guidelines. They don't shut people down, but they try to, you know, give you guidelines on, because a lot of these people have done some of these rivers that you're thinking of doing. So I think that would be helpful. So thanks for that, Yuri. Uh, I, I see you've actually already done it, so. <laughs> well, you could always review uh, it. And if there's anything we yeah, missed, well, definitely. take but a crack great. at it. You know, we're always open because the way we, yeah generally do it we say it's written on this date but then if there's a revision we say it's revised on this date and we just repost it and just carry on because the idea is to add everybody's input and insight and you know trying to make the club and spread the, the experience to other members of course that's the idea of a club so um, i see a few new people we got oh we got uh, ian up there hi ian are you new or are you just new to uh, the Zoom thing? Uh, thanks. I'm, um, uh, no, I've been a member uh, oh, a year and a half, maybe two years. Okay. So you're pretty um, new. Yeah. 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 And um, uh, I've tried to get on other uh, Zoom meetings that I saw, but, uh, you know, schedule didn't uh, yeah. allow me to do that. And I really wanted to see this tonight. So I was able Good. to make the time. Great. Yeah, this is a, a smaller meeting because it's kind of like a workshop almost. Uh, generally, the presentations are a little more attended, like 30-ish kind of people. Okay, okay great. Uh, Christopher, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, so um, I'm just thinking about day trips. I, um, so basically for day trips, I'm just thinking, well, I, I said to everyone the last time I saw them, oh, let's hopefully we'll get you to do the Saugeen or or the yep. Maitland's a nice run. And I'm hoping yep. people that live up in the head area or the beaver or whatever, I've never seen those rivers. So I'm hoping there'll be a few day trips in the spring. Um, how do you, uh, you, you would just use the first outing page. Basically, you wouldn't get into a spreadsheet. No, um, no. Um, you, you would probably use the first sheet on a day trip just to say, here's the people on my trip. And I have, you know, yep. contact information and stuff like that. Because just even coordinating, okay, the put-in, people get lost driving to the put-in sometimes, right? So generally, mm -hmm. if you were the organizer, you know, you'd put out a little Google map, you know, just with a link and say, I, you know, start from Toronto and go to here. And we're going to meet here. And here's the takeout. And you just send a few links. But you'd, when people are signing up, you would make your little list, basically. So like this event... Um, like if I go back to this event, if I'm an organizer of this event, just give me a second here and I'll zip it over there. I'm already there. No, okay. So this event is the, the trip planning event. And if I go down to the trip planning more, oh, I guess I'm not sharing right now. Let me share. Sorry. Okay. So when you're an organizer, you get to see all these tabs, right? So you're viewing this as the event. You can edit the event. You can approve. Well, because I'm a webmaster, I can approve the event, access control, grant people. So here's the participants. So people that signed up for this event will be on this sheet, basically. So here I am. 
uh, you know, and various other people. And because, you know, I made the, um, the, um, oh, I guess I'm not sure in here. Yep. Can't there see it. There. Sorry. Oh, Sorry. There we can. Yeah. I was halfway. Yeah. So there's all these tabs here, but because I'm the organizer, I could see participants. So it shows people that are signed up, you know, you're a member, blah, 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 Sam, you know, et cetera, Jeff Mead, Sandro, you know, et cetera. Right. Um, so you, as an event organizer, you know, you would go down here and you would, you know, whatever it is. I, I see a lot more than most people, but right here, submit an outing. And that's how you create an outing. So anybody, any member will see this uh, once it opens. And then it's straightforward. It gives you like a template, your name, you choose, you know, what kind of outing, you write a description, where is it, the date, the registration cutoff, you know, et cetera. You go all the way to the bottom, you fill in all this information and you hit submit. That will go to the coordinator of the, uh, yeah, outings so bill ness and mary perkins and one of them will review it usually within a day and they'll push a button so on their screen they're going to have an approval screen uh, when this gets pushed and then it goes live basically and when it goes live you can go back in and edit it so if this if i push this you can go back in and edit whatever any words anything you want uh, you know as the day as the event progresses um, so generally, uh, what happens is, you know, if you don't know, like I always tell people, I say, okay, let's just say you want to go to Algonquin in 2022, just write it. I want to go to Algonquin in 2022, uh, you know, July, August, whatever time frame. And it's very vague. You don't know where, you don't know what put in. And what happens, people start contacting and say, I really want to go to Canoe Lake and to wherever. Somebody else says, I want to go to Smoky Lake. And all of a sudden, you got two or three people. Okay, let's right now, we're going to say we're going to go to Smoke, Smoke Lake and Porcupine Lake, you know, heading south. And these change the name of the event slightly. It's still your event. And you just keep morphing it until it solidifies into a, a more concrete event. So that's what I tell people to do, um, you know, since we're trying to go... Um, in-person events next year we should start you know posting some events basically gary can i throw in there um actually it's more towards chris i know chris was talking before about doing the Sogin, um and in the past that was a three-day trip um i'd love to actually get that going again and, and if chris is interested um we could throw one together three oh absolutely for people. sure but, I, yeah. you know, like with a couple of overnights on the river. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a great spring, like, you know, May trip. Yeah. yeah. And actually, if you to... made it um, like a uh, two-day versus a three-day, I know when it's a three-day, you have to do the long weekend, and they have this sogging float thing, which is, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, that's definitely the, that's the wrong yeah. weekend. That's the yeah. wrong weekend. <laughs> <That's> right, <laughs> yeah. Totally, yeah. yeah. It's that's, just a bunch of people getting drunk on floats. Um, yeah. Yeah. You really yeah. want to pick maybe the weekend before or yeah. after, but probably yeah. before one week because the water's good. That. And I, I also like that. your idea of the Maitland. I've hiked next to the Maitland before. It looks really nice. It looks like a Grand River mm -hmm. kind of thing. We just yeah, need people to launch those trips and people will go. Yeah, it's 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 beautiful the Maitland, and it's only good till June, the only, uh, early June. Yeah. The only problem I'd say though is uh, like the Saugeen being way over in in western on western southern Ontario, it's quite a hike. Um, I wouldn't really want to do just a two day trip on it. Yeah. You know, an overnight. Well, then you'd have to take an extra hike. Friday or Monday or whatever it is. Yeah. And that's that's something to think about. Yep, the upper Saugeen too is fantastic. Um, 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 oh shoot, I forget that run, but it's it's quite high up and it's class class one uh, for thirty k um, mm -hmm. um, before the dam. So that that one's fantastic. That's very early spring though. Okay, yeah. sounds like we got yeah. somebody to organize that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, but yeah. all those class one rivers are excellent to get people going. You know. 
Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because they're just a little direction and you're off you go, you know? Um, then you bobble through whatever you bobble through. Hmm. Yeah. No, okay. mostly I go with the Wellington Waterloo Club, I believe, just mm -hmm. sort of remnants of that. And uh, no, they're, they're fantastic trips and the shuttles are great and uh, they're, they're quite efficiently run. Yeah. But um, okay. the big one I'm hoping for, actually, <laughs> while I'm here, is the sand. I want to do the sand, but I'm not 100% sure on the train um, yet. And I, I sort of think, well, I can't post it until I find out if the train's going and, yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah, so that's the... Now, but but where, in your sense, maybe yeah. just post it anyway. Yeah. There's talk yeah. of that train running again, though. I did that mm -hmm. trip about 25 years ago. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They. You they, must have been only two or three slated. years old. About that, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the train is running. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, it's running from Sault Ste. Marie. Mm -hmm. Well, it used to go like from I think it was called Freighter Station or something. Well, there's the because they used to run a tourist train up from Sault Ste. Yeah. Marie. But then, then I think the one that drops you off for the canoeing goes from like I think it's called Freighter Station, tiny yeah. little town at the end of a road, not even a town. Okay, you can't load canoes at Freighter. You have to start load in the uh, used to, but uh, you have to load in uh, the Sioux, and a few people go up with the your canoes and everything else, and the, and the drivers set up a shuttle from freighter uh, uh, down to, you, you have to set up your shuttle in the park from freighter and then in the melt, near the mouth of the uh, sand. So you have to drive up ahead there. I actually drove by Toyota Corolla up that freighter road. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> drove a little old Mazda RX-7 up that old road. <laughs> Actually, you no, know, we didn't. Sorry, we parked the car and it was the shuttle, I think. No, maybe we did drive it up. I can't remember now. Yeah, if you drove it, you would remember it. Oh, we were, the yeah. drive, Whoever the driver is would remember it. Yeah, kind of wild. I remember the drive. <laughs> and I remember being the only canoeist because there was all these people going up to their hunting cabins. So it was yeah. just lined with like Rubbermaid oh. bins. And yeah. <laughs> There's another way you can start further north and come down rather than using this way you don't have to use a freighter mm. but uh but uh no it, uh, freighter is just a flag stop now so you carry on only you know what i'm oh. thinking is we maybe can run a zoom meeting not on any subject but just talking about canoe you know destinations that's what uh, this so turned into right <laughs> yeah well, this is what this is turning into yeah we're off the top thing yeah. planning, um, planning, but it, yeah, you know, it, it might be something that people are interested in i just have a it's a, a present it's no presentation it's just a discussion on um, possible <laughs> 2022 um, outings and you know and people have questions about whatever river um there are people in the audience like jeff and yourself kathy that you know i've done something 25 years ago yeah. that might be interesting so maybe yeah. i'll think it's about three posting times something. actually <laughs> yeah I've done the sand three times uh well that's a good trip to be aware of why you have to skelt because it's <clears> relatively <throat> easy water but very susceptible to uh sweepers that weren't there the last mm. time you were at it okay and, and so that's something you gotta watch out for. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna shut her down. Um, unless somebody has an, another question or anything. Um, no, we're fine. I'm great. Fine. Okay. So thanks for joining in.